Oh, we're live now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Q&A. Um, we're with Owen King today, the author of The Curator, um, here live at the Virtual Village Hall. So thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. Um, if you could introduce yourself in the chat, that would be great. Um, maybe let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, Owen's actually all the way in America. So if anyone's quite as far away as Owen, that would be great to find out. <laughs> Yes. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me, Annabelle. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Oh, thank you for joining. Um, we have just been talking before the session started, and we wanted to begin in the chat um, and open up the questions to you first. Um, so we wanted to ask you all, who or what is your favourite fictional animal? Um, if you could pop your answer in the chat, we'll go through some of those. But Owen, do you want to kick us off? You know, I think that... Uh, I think my favorite is Charlotte from Charlotte's Web. Oh. Edie White. I, I find her very um, compelling and amusing. And I, I've always loved um, the uh, sort of a simple beauty to that book by E.B. White. Um, and I always think of the first line where uh, that sets up the whole book, which is the uh, the little girl's father is getting the ax, right? And, um, you know, that's the whole book, right? Is like, is can they save Wilbur, right? From from the dad. And yeah. Wilbur's a great character too. Um, but I always loved, and I, I, I love how smart Charlotte is, but I also, um, I love how she doesn't, um, She's clever, but what with the most important thing, which is that she's gonna die, she's totally straightforward with Wilbur. Mm -hmm. You know, like she doesn't um uh she doesn't like um, gild that. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna yeah. die and you're gonna have to go on without me. And I uh, I also find that quite moving. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting as well to see animals not kind of portrayed as like cutesy things, like um, like actual animals with emotions and thoughts. So that's always interesting. Um, I think I think my favorite would probably be Paddington Bear. <laughs> I love Paddington, like the Paddington movies. Um, I think he's great, and he is quite cutesy. But <laughs> well, he's a sharp dress, sharp dresser. Um, <laughs> I, I think that there's. Um, you know, very anthropomorphic animals c can be wonderful in fiction. And yeah. um, I've written animals into fiction that had personalities that were very upfront. And one of the things I tried to do with the curator was this is all these cats in the curator. And with that, I tried to make them super real, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially because most of the cats in the book are feral. Yeah. Um, they're driven by their own priorities and oftentimes pretty much all the time we don't understand what they are mm -hmm. um and so i tried to go that uh, the opposite direction and yeah. have them be compelling and interesting and uh hopefully gain some affection for the reader but while also being you know flesh and blood yeah being <laughs> cats <laughs> yes, exactly i see yeah. somebody who likes winnie the pooh and you gotta love pooh bear yeah <laughs> yeah catherine said winnie the pooh and um, Paz is saying hello from Derbyshire. Hi, Paz. Oh. Um, Piglet's great. Piglet, yeah. yeah. Oh, Piglet's a cutie too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I also like it. I don't know if you could count this as a fictional animal, but, you know, um, in Harry Potter, Professor McGonagall turns into a cat. I think right. That's, that's a pretty cool one. Um, and yeah, bonus points, everybody, if you can think of a cat. Who's your favourite fictional animal? Oh, Nicola, hi from Liverpool. Hello. Yes. I'm in London. Um, Owen is in New York. Yeah, I'm in New Ulster York. County in New York, which is about um, uh, about two hours north of New York City. And it's wow. across, um, I'm on the side of the river across from Poughkeepsie. Okay. Is, is the, you know, near Kingston. Those are the two bigger, mm. bigger cities uh, near where I live, although they're not you know, huge cities by any means. I always forget that New York is uh, not just 
like Manhattan. It's it's um like actually a big a state, isn't it? New York, like New York. Yeah, state. it's down there at the bottom of the state. Um, yeah. In the little uh, well, it's an island, and um, so, you know, I would take the Metro North to get there. So, oh hi, Julie from Rotherham. Um, thank you everyone for joining. If you've joined while we've been chatting, just to give you some context, we've been talking about our favorite fictional animals. So a few people have popped that in the chat if you want to give yours. Um, but yeah, uh, we've just been going through mine and Owen's, different cats, different um, Paddington bears and Winnie the Poohs, <laughs> all the classics really. Um, but yeah, when the chat settles down, I, I will get um, started with the Q&A, um, if that's okay with you, Owen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, so... Um, I, Paz, and Catherine, and Nicola, and Julie, and everybody else. Yeah, hi everyone, thank you so much. Ooh, the oh, the Moomins. Moomins. Yeah. But that's the question is, I mean, are the Moomins, I mean, obviously we're all animals, but the Moomins, I feel like they are um, something, uh, they're kind of people, right? Yeah. They're, you know, sort of hippo people. <laughs> Yeah, they are cute as well. I feel like everyone's going for very cute animals, which I would I would go for too. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, oh, all the animals in Animal Farm. That's a good one. All of the animals. Some of them are a bit horrible. <laughs> well, there's also the um, there's the wolves in the George R. R. Martin books. Th those aren't very cute, but they're pretty awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nicholas said, yes, hippo people is a good description. <laughs> no, I love them. I love the Moomins and, um, you know, I feel like they're catching on here in the States after all these years. You see them, you see the Moomin toys and uh, things in the bookstores now and you never used to. It's sort, sort of sort of caught a little bit of um, uh, a breeze here. Yeah, no, um, they are great. I, I don't, I've never really been into Moomins like as a whole, um, like when I was little or anything. So I don't really know much about them, but I know I know what they look like. They're very cute. <laughs> yes, um, they're very cute, and it's you know it's more um, oh, it's more surreal, right? Than yeah. than some of the some of the other. It, it's there's a weirdness to it that's a little bit. Um, different and and special um from from other children's books i think oh, oh Aaron. Aronson, he's great too yep the armored bear oh hi from scotland hi allison um okay so the chat does seem to be settling now so i think now would be a good time to get into the q a if if you're ready oh yeah yeah oh that's a good quote from allison you ain't mm -hmm. afraid, are you? Not yet. When I am, I shall master the fear. That's, nice. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> um, and hi, Amy, too. Um, but yeah, I'll get started now. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining and for all of your comments so far. I'm really looking forward to receiving and asking Owen all of your questions. Um, and thanks also to the Virtual Village Hall for having us. Um, we really love doing these interviews. Um, I'm Annabelle Morgan here from Listening Books. For any of you in the audience who aren't familiar with what we do, we're an audiobook lending charity um, here in the UK, and our service is for anyone who um, who finds that their ability to read is affected by an illness, mental health condition, disability, or learning difficulty. Um, I think our details will be shared throughout, so if you think our audiobooks could help you, then please do check us out. Um, but that's not why we're here today. We're here to talk to Owen King all about his latest novel, The Curator. So thank you so much, Owen, for being here today. We really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Um, I am going to give a quick introduction. I hope it's not too um, embarrassing because it sometimes okay. it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, Owen King is a best-selling author, a Sunday Times bestseller, whose recent novel, The Curator, was one of our Members' Choice Award nominees for 2023. Owen's also known for short stories, graphic novels, and television production. Um, our members here at Listening Books absolutely loved The Curator last year, um, so we're really delighted to have you here to talk with us all about it. It's uh, Thank you for having me. It's great. No, thank you. Um, right, so 
We'll begin now then. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please pop them in the comments and I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, but to kick us off, Owen, if you could just maybe give a brief introduction to the curator for anyone who hasn't read it or listened to it yet. Um, yeah. Okay, well, it's, um, it's a sort of alternate, um, alternate history fantasy, I guess. It, it, but the history part of it's a little bit a little bit uh, vague. The uh, the book takes place in a city that's sort of a, an unnamed city that's sort of a amalgamation of Victorian London and Five Points New York and um, Findesiegel. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Vienna. Um, those are the cities that I was thinking of when I created it. And uh, this city is the uh, the metropolis in a small country that has uh, undergone a bloodless revolution. And the revolution has sort of um, stalled out right at the finish line. Um, the city has been been captured by the revolutionaries, but they don't have control of the whole country and they're, they're um, trying to negotiate with the, with the royalty which they've evicted. And um, against this, that backdrop, uh, a young woman who is a domestic servant has um, sort of insinuated herself into a position of um, uh, small authority and she wants to, uh, and she's, by doing so, she, she has gotten herself a position as the curator of this very obscure museum on this very obscure street. And she's done so for reasons that aren't immediately clear to the reader, uh, but there's something she wants to learn about in this place. And so uh, she's quite persistent and quite canny and um, uh, quite smart. But uh, one of the things uh, about her, about Dora, is that she is um, very retiring. She doesn't want anybody to notice her uh, because she knows um, that in this very patriarchal society where she's trying to operate, that um, that will um, be of no benefit. It's much better for her to sort of operate uh, underneath everything. And uh, what else? So the story is about her uh, trying to solve this mystery that's not immediately clear at the beginning. And there's this revolution going on in the background. And it's this strange city uh, that's sort of familiar, but it's also different people there. Their religion is uh, uh, the most favored religion is a sort of cat worship. <laughs> and um, there is a, uh, a sort of conspiratorial sense of, of wheels inside of wheels moving in the background. And, um, and Dora, our protagonist, uh, has to survive and, and, solve the mystery that she wants to solve, but also, you know, uh, it brings her up against these larger mass machinations that are going on politically. Yeah. Um, we do have a great question um, from Paz to start us off. Uh, thank you for the overview. Um, that Paz has said, um, I love the audiobook. Did you have any involvement in choosing who narrated it? How similar is Marin Island to the voice that was in your head when writing the book? Yeah, she's, uh, I mean, it's not exactly that, I definitely had my own voice in my head when I was writing the book, um, but uh, I did want Marin to uh, be the narrator. She was my first choice. I loved, uh, I've loved all her performances that I've heard. She was unbelievable in uh, her performance of Sleeping Beauties. And I, <clears throat> what I like, so much about her is that like all great actors she is bringing her own creativity to bear on mm -hmm. the performance and so if if what she's doing is different than what i heard in my head at any point it's always better than what i heard in my head you know so for instance there's um there are these uh, characters who never leave this pub, these drunks that basically live there. And there's there's this one 
um, drunk who has a sort of permanent slur that he speaks with. And when I wrote him, I thought of him as being very big and grandiose, you know? And then when Marin personifies him, he's very subdued and like, uh, she really leans into the sloppiness and mm. sadness of him. And I like it better. And it and there's and there's still sort of um a grandeur to some of the bigger things that he says, but it's tinged with this sort of um alcoholic sadness mm. that she found in the character. And now when I read him, that's how he sounds to me. Um and uh, when I listened to the book, when I, I didn't plan on listening to the whole thing, because oftentimes when you listen to somebody read your book out loud, it's quite embarrassing <laughs> uh, because all you hear is it just sounds a little strange. But yeah, um, she's so good. I listened to several hours of it and I was just entertained. You know, I was yeah. really enjoying it um, because she made me look so good. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I love her and I love I love that performance. Yeah, no, it was great. I listened to the audiobook too, um, and I would really recommend it to anyone um, who's in the audience that hasn't listened to it. Um, but um, I, there are a few interesting things that I picked up on there. Um, it's interesting that you you like the changes that are made. I don't know if this is just my personality, but I feel like if someone was reading my work and it wasn't how I'd intended it to be, I might be like, oh, like what's going on? Like <laughs> this, this isn't what I wanted. But for you, um, it's an improvement. Almost, you um, say? Well, if, because she found something that was there that was almost subconscious, you know? Um, and I think it's like that when you write, um, when you script things and the actors perform them, they, um, it is a performance, you know? It's, they are taking this thing and turning it into their thing. Mm -hmm. And you want to give them the leeway to do that. And when they're brilliant, like Marin is, um, new amazing things emerge that you suddenly see yeah so i i, I love that um and i love that she i i'm find it um very gratifying that she was able to find that in there you know yeah. that it hadn't that it had like um a space for her to get inside mm -hmm. yeah um claire has asked um Sorry if this has already been asked. I joined a bit late, but why cats? Which I love, by the way. I assume she right. means why cats as the gods in the in the city. Well, I thought to myself, you know, I um, I had written quite a bit of the book, may, maybe like half of it, and there was no real, um, maybe not half of it, like a quarter of the book, and I and I thought to myself, well, there's no real religious life in this city and that i don't believe that that would be the case there would be a religious life and um but i thought to myself it shouldn't be exactly um parallel because everything in the book is just a little bit to the left or to the right or just a little bit out of focus it shouldn't be the same as something that we recognize and so um, I did have some of those, you, you know, there's clearly some sort of Christian life in the city. Um, there's some people that mention that. Um, but I created this um, pagan cat worship religion um, that's especially uh, important to some of the less well-off people in the city. And... Um, and I thought that helped, well, one, it was fun and added to the sort of atmosphere of mystery because cats can be so uh, peculiar and hard to read. Uh, but I also thought that it helps teach the reader that things are going to be a little bit different here, mm -hmm. you know, that you may recognize some things but keep in mind um, that some other things are different and you have to be aware. You yeah. have to be on your toes a little bit for those differences. 
So would you say you chose cats because of cats as what they are? They're a bit, um, you can't, mysterious. You don't really know what's going on. Or would it be because you love cats? <laughs> it's both. Yeah. It, it's both. And I, and I thought that um, they feel magical mm -hmm. to me. Um, and Dora has a little bit of cat in her in the way that um, she can be quite secretive. Yeah. And, but at the same time, I tried to work crossways against some of the expectations that a reader might have about a book with magic and cats. You know, the cats act like cats, like real cats. You know, yeah. they're flesh and blood. They're not... Um, anthropomorphic in the way that say Charlotte or um, mm -hmm. Pooh is, you know, they're, they're um, more um, flesh and blood and, you know, killing little creatures to survive and setting forth on missions that we don't understand as human beings you know mm -hmm. and we just uh, and we just observe the cat and and hopefully the cats but there's one cat in particular but hopefully the reader or the listener in the case of audiobooks ultimately feels like they have an idea of uh of what that cat whose name is 17 is up to mm -hmm. yeah yeah I was, I was gonna say um in the chapter which is written from 17's perspective but then it's it's not from like inside her brain, if you get what I mean, it, it doesn't. It doesn't talk about her emotions or her thoughts. It's just like a cat doing cat things. Um, did Did you find that difficult, or um, to try and find out what a cat would be doing behind the scenes, or or um, easier than human? No, I really liked. I I found that chapter really easy to write, and I, um, you know, I. Uh, most of the book is told in the kind of third person that I believe we would call um, free and direct discourse, you know, so it's inside the third person point of view, um, but but through, uh, but filtered through the character's thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all the human characters in the book. And there's a bunch of them, you know, we usually we go from Dora who thinks of herself as D we go from her to somebody else and back to her and to somebody else and back to her. And that's usually the way that the book is arranged. Mm -hmm. But with 17, um, what's so fun is that I didn't have to filter it through her thoughts. Yeah. We're just seeing what she's doing and seeing what she's seeing. It, it makes it a lot easier on a descriptive level, it's not quite so involved. I'm not having to, um, I only have to think about what I believe she'd do. I don't have to explain to the reader why she's yeah. doing it. Yeah. You know, it's up to them to make that interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, Cla Claire's commented, um, that alone must have required a lot of thought to make that work in the book. I agree, yeah. Um, Oh, Amy has asked, um, have you got a particular process you use for world building? There's a lot, there's lots of intricate world building in the book. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's a particular process, but I did a lot of reading about Victorian life and about uh, 19th century cities. And I wanted to um get details that made the re the reader feel like uh they were in a place where the characters dealt with real challenges on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. um, that they have to eat and that's not that simple and they have to get from place to place and there's no cars to drive them and um that everything is limited by the technology and uh by the societal rules that are in place in this in this unnamed city so you know i i read i want to say like a dozen, two dozen different kinds of books about 
about those cities and Victorian life. And um, those inspired me with some of the world building and um, gave me some details in other, in other ways. And so that's, that's sort of the way I do it. I think that with, um, with research, you always end up doing a lot more than you uh, need to do. And it, it gives you confidence that you can make these leaps and yeah. build these city streets that are just made of words. Um, and the only way it's, it's, you can never do too much unless you think that you have to put it all in. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you have to pull it, put it all in, it, it could be quite lugubrious. And so you just want to have those details that you feel like uh, you just want to have those details come out of your research that you feel like are evocative and uh, telling and um, and then get on with with the story part. Mm -hmm. That kind of um, leads on to another question we've got from Paz, who's asked which writers have inspired you? Well, this book um, is very much uh, inspired by Little Dorrit, which is one of my my very favorite Dickens novels. And um, uh, one of the, I think probably my first um, uh, encounter with Dickens was watching the um, public television. I'm, I'm sure it was uh, BBC, but it was the Little Dorrit version with Alec Guinness in it when I was a child and I watched it with my family. And um, and I think that's that was an experience, you know, I was probably, I don't know, 10, uh, that... Um, if I had come at him in a different way, I might've said, oh, this great big book looks extremely difficult to me, but I watched the show and um, I was totally, um, it's just an enthralling story. And um, and I, I was fascinated by those characters and the debtor's prison and how Amy Dorrit, um, you know, selflessly, strives to do all these things for all these people that don't really um, appreciate her, take her for granted. And uh, and then, of course, Arthur Clennam's mother is, you know, bizarre and has is up to something that we, we don't entirely understand. Um, and eventually, in the end, her house just explodes or collapses, which is uh, one of those great Dickens things. Um, so that was my first encounter with Dickens and 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 then after that, I got into reading the books. And um, in the case of the curator, you know, Dora, who thinks of herself as D, is a domestic. She's kind of um, a, a very distant echo of Amy Dorrit. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I think the, the one thing about little Dorrit is she's so selfless sometimes. She feels, you know, kind of saintly. Mm -hmm. And I don't really believe in that. And so Dora is somebody that's very flawed and uh, has failings, but hopefully we, we love and uh, we love and admire her, her heroism and um, her fearlessness and her smarts, even though she does have, you know, some, some failings or some, some things that are, that, that make her uh, less than perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, that's a long way of saying, um, I, I think in the case of, you know, I always try to do something different, really different with every book. Um, it's kind of an obsession of mine. And with this book, I wanted to write my version of a Victorian novel, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about not reading at the same time because I can't read in a place that's like what I'm writing. You know, I was mm -hmm. only reading modern things as I wrote the book. Um, but I was, I was trying to think about uh, Dickens and Trollope and Elizabeth Gaskell and Zola and and how their books felt to me in my mind. And I wanted to, and I tried to make the book have some of that feeling to catch some of that. So, mm -hmm. No, it, it definitely did. Um, I, I was wondering why you didn't set a specific time for the novel, like you, even though it obviously has a lot of inspiration, Dickensian, Victorian, that, that's very clear. There's never a date, like it's not yeah. a set in stone. So why did you decide to keep it vague, keep it blurry? 
I think it struck me as um, I thought it it felt more um, in keeping one of the things that's revealed, this is a spoiler alert, so shut your ears, is that there's more than one world. And it it seemed more interesting to me to be in a world that's a version of ours, but different than it seemed to be in a world that is definitely the one we know, and then learn that there are other worlds. Mm -hmm. You know, so that seemed more done to me. Um, it seemed more interesting. I mean, it's kind of all been done, but it seemed more interesting to me to start from the difference and then reveal. Um, and I also think that it's it's just it, from a creative standpoint, it was more fun to borrow and from different time periods that were sort of close together. It seemed more fun to do that and more surprising for the reader. You know, but certainly probably for a lot of readers, it's quite annoying. You know, if, if you're if you're like, I, I, I would like this to be um, in a time and place that's definite. Um, I would understand that. That's just a different a different point of view. But that's not what I did. Yeah, no, I really liked it. I remember there's one moment in particular where um, Dora finds a Gucci handbag <laughs> and it just, it just made, me, it made me laugh. And she obviously, she didn't know what Gucci was. And she was like, oh, this bag must belong to a woman called Gucci. That's, that's why it's a Gucci yes, handbag. Yeah, yeah um, there's a, a, a sort of hole opens in, in this museum where she's, where she's curating, uh, or she really isn't curating it. She's just like, uh, well, she is in a way. She's taking care of it. She's improving it um some things start appearing that that don't belong there and one of them is is a, a mannequin with a gucci handbag um and uh yeah i thought that i thought that was that was fun yeah it was yeah. <laughs> uh claire's laughing in the comments um yeah. she's also asked um it's a big world did you have any ideas or characters that you had to discard as you couldn't fit them in um i trimmed i trimmed a few characters quite a bit i i think in retrospect um you know when anytime i my and i would be surprised if any other writers don't feel the same way i always end up publishing a book and then feeling like oh well if i could have just made this one change uh it would be even better um and certainly with the curator i have less of that feeling um than at any other time. But I think that there's a there's uh, there's two characters. There's a, a man who drives a tram, and there's a character who's sort of a failed academic, and they end up having a role in the plot late in the book. And I think in retrospect, I kind of wish they were just one character. Hmm. Um, although that would have taken some reimagining that made them neither character. But any in any case, um, there was a lot more about um, a few characters and um, I tried to chip them away so that it was just the most, um, just the most important things. I mean, I'll give you an example of the way that I, that I write though. Um, there is um, a scene early in the book where Dora goes, she's, she's been a domestic at this university and she goes to uh, the, the apartments, the rooms of a young man who was associated with the crown and that young man has fled. And uh, Dora goes through his apartment looking for stuff that she can use. And um, when I wrote the scene, it was like three times as long because she finds all this different stuff. And I didn't know, I mean, I, I had lots of places along the way I was going to go in the book, but I wasn't sure exactly what parts of the things that she was going to take from this apartment might be useful for my story. Mm -hmm. So I have her take, a, I mean, just tons of stuff <laughs> in the first draft. And then by the time, you know, I'd gotten to the latter stages of the book, I knew that, well, she only really needs to find these 
three things in his apartment, really four, so that there's one thing that's like not necessary. So it's, you know, believable. So it's not just like totally, um, it's not just a facilitation. Um, so I had to go back and cut out all those things, but that's, that's kind of the, uh, one of the ways in which I write is that sometimes if I am not exactly sure, um, what might come in handy later, I'll just make it big. And then I know I can go back later and put it through the shrinking ray. Yeah. <laughs> um, Amy has asked a question, which I think relates to um, like television production. Um, she's asked, do you think that being a writer makes you a better producer or vice versa? Um, well, I don't have a ton of, of experience as a producer. Crediting is kind of a funny thing, but um, I think the the experience of writing for television and and doing a little bit of film scripting I've never had a feature make it to the camera I've only done TV and I've done short films I think that it does um it gives you an idea of what is possible with the budgetary constraints but then then again at the same time you don't want to like you don't want to write a story you don't want to write a script for production mm -hmm. you want to you want to be as imaginative and and adventurous as you possibly can and then maybe maybe then you want to start thinking about what's actually viable um but I think it's good to, to have it, to see it from both sides. And I, and I think that, that script writing and, and um, I think that it's, it is helpful sometimes in a plotting sense in, in all kinds of senses, because it, it's a kind of writing that's boils things down to their very um, just the essentials because scripts don't really have a, um, the descriptive part of it is very limited and you're not, the voice part of it is very limited. And that is the hardest part of book writing is the voice. You have to have a consistent voice and you, you have to have a voice that can hit all the notes that are important. And I think that's a, why it's hard for a lot of writers to get into, you know, you write one book and getting into the next book can be tough because you got to lock into that voice that's going to be the voice of that book. Mm -hmm. with, with films, when you write those, you're you're doing the story and the characters, but the director and the actors kind of make the voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, something I was um, thinking when listening to the curator was that um, there are so many characters and they all, I, I can just imagine that they all have really interesting backstories, um, even though we don't find out um, some of them. Um, so I was thinking that it would be really good as like a series of spin-offs and finding out more about each character, like a kind mm -hmm. of a Hunger Games situation, you know, you go back in time and you find out why President Snow was evil, like you can yes. find that out with different characters from the curator. Um, do you think that would be a possibility? Because I, for one, would love that. <laughs> you know, I, thought, I, I have a pretty good idea for another book in the world. I, I don't know if I feel like it's something I want to do right now. And I don't know. I'm a little reticent because I feel like to write a sequel, you need to have such an enormous audience that knows the premise that you're building on. Mm -hmm. I did. I do have another idea for a story that would be set in the same world later in the timeline with a few of the same characters, but with some characters that were mentioned. You know, there's um, uh, there's a character named Ike who's usually people seem to like him the best, and he's sort of yeah. a, street, a streetwise young guy. I think he would be in it. Um, maybe not as the main character, but he would he would be an important figure in in that. Um, but yeah, I, and I, I'm glad that you got that out of it because one of the things that I love about 
um, Dickens especially, is the way that all the minor characters just pop. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is so eccentric mm -hmm. and vivid, uh, even if they only get two scenes. And I tried to do that with every character that crosses onto the stage of the book. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about um, like the original publication of the Dickens um, books, they're often in like periodicals, right? So each right. each periodical had to have something that made people want to read the next one. Um, and I think you could really see that inspiration in the curator. Like every part kind of like led into others. And I know at, at the end, when all of these connections were coming together, I was like, oh, how, how did this happen? Like <laughs> just before my eyes, <laughs> um, all of these like threads started unraveling. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can definitely see that inspiration. Um, we had a comment that I didn't have time to read out earlier, but Nicola said, um, I've not read the book yet, but now I know there is cat worship. I'm looking forward to it even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's cat danger too. So, you know, <clears throat> our, our main catch is pretty safe. But yeah. <laughs> I can't make any promises. <laughs> um, yeah, there was one comment um, in the book itself that I, I've been thinking of when we've been talking about cats. There was someone who said um, that the newspapers are full of stories about cats to um, distract from real issues, like human right. issues. Um, and I thought that was so funny. Um, do, do you think that was the kind of like a conscious comment um, comparing cats to like today's celebrity culture? Um, maybe in a way, I, I was just thinking it, it was just one of those things that was improvised because it made a lot of sense that um, the people that are conspiring would see to it that the really serious issues got pushed to the side and there were these articles about this missing cat. Um, <laughs> but I think, I mean, even today, I mean, it's like, you know, no, by no means do I want to uh, put any, say anything negative about Larry, you know, right? But Larry, the the English prime minister's cat, right? You know, like there's a lot of, I see articles about Larry every once in a while. And it's like, you know, Larry's doing his thing. Uh, and we are curious, but it's not like the, you know, it's not like the first thing, right? And, uh, um, so, oh, I see there's a question that says, um, uh, let me emphasize, by no means am I casting aspersions on Larry. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, how long did it take to write, Allison asks. Well, the curator is based on a short story that I published, I think, way back in 2014. <clears throat> Not 100% sure on the timing of that, but um, but the short story is, um, <laughs> Larry is the best thing about Downing Street, I love it. Um, the short story is just about Dora and uh, her... Uh, significant other who's this uh, sort of callow young man who I, I hope the reader feels like grows through the course of the book named Robert. Um, and and it all takes place in the museum and the revolution is even farther in the background. Mm -hmm. So it's a long short story, but the world building is totally, um, totally different. It's all gestured at. You don't actually step into any of it. And you know, there's almost none of the supporting characters. So I wrote that way back in 2014. And I want to say that was like about just like a 40 page short story. And then I, I started writing the book, I think in 2017. So it probably took me about three years to really write mm -hmm. maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and, uh, and it ended up tonally, it's quite different. I think from the story, the story is kind of darker. Hmm. Not that the book isn't isn't pretty dark in places, but but um, everybody's motivations, even the the sort of protagonist characters, all their motivations are a little bit corrupted. Mm -hmm. So you said that the in the short story, revolution wasn't at the forefront. It was kind of more of a focus on Dora and her um, her boyfriend. Um, yeah. So what made you decide? to bring revolution into the forefront to make it like a key um, point of the novel, like when writing it. I, just could, see, I could see it all when I was writing the story. I just had, a, I, I could really, really envision the, the wider world. 
<clears throat> and the kinds of people that were in it. And I thought she was so interesting and I wanted to spend more time with her and know more about her. <clears throat> and I wanted to see more of the world through her eyes and explain more fully the nature of this conspiracy that's happening in the background. Mm -hmm. And um, I just felt like there was a whole three course meal there yeah. and I wanted to have it, you know, <laughs> it, but then it, like any, any time you do something like that, you know, you end up leaving the story way behind. And yeah. so the short story has, you know, it's like 40 pages. It's quite a long story, but there's probably like six sentences from the story that made it into the book. Mm -hmm. And they're all applying in a different way than they were intended the first time because the characters, mm -hmm. even Dora is quite quite different, I think, in the book. Yeah. And so do you find that Dora, like as you were writing the novel that Dora, the character that you had from the beginning, kind of warped into someone else? Yeah, she's really different. She's she's more of a hero in the book and in the in the um in the story, she's more of like a She's more of a schemer, I guess. I like the story though. I like that it's different. I like that it's like a like a weird sibling to the book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like you know, Mycroft to Sherlock a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the time, and I think that we are going to have to wrap things up shortly. Yeah. Um, but I do have one more question for you uh, from me. Um, uh, if you if you could. If you could ask for readers to take one thing away from the curator, from the reading or listening experience, what, what would that be? Um, well, I, I, I want people to engage and um, get wrapped up in the story in the world. Um, in the fullest way possible. Um, I want it to be satisfying and diverting. And um, if it's thought provoking in any way, if it if it makes you think about uh, politics or human relations in some some deeper way, I certainly hope it does. But that's secondary and once the book is out there it's belongs to the world to engage with it however they would like yeah no it really does um I, and i find that interesting that it kind of relates to what you said earlier about marin reading um reading a different voice into different characters like e even though you write the book you only have so much control over it um like it, it really goes on to be written into something else by so many different people um, yeah, and you you don't people bring their own set of critical ideas to everything that they read or watch. Mm -hmm. um, we all have our own um, our own blueprint for how that's going to go, and yeah. who am I to say that any way of reading the book or listening to the book is the wrong way you know everybody's gonna gonna do it their own way it's out of my hands now <laughs> yeah uh, it's, it's good to hear that you don't mind people reading different things into it um i, I would imagine it is read quite differently in um like america to in the uk as well with certain like political illusions throughout um it makes a different reading experience but anyway that's that's a whole other conversation yeah. <laughs> um yeah i am gonna have to wrap things up sadly um but thank you so much everyone for joining for all of your thank you and thank you annabelle and everybody that came and um you know if you enjoyed the book i'm thrilled and if you're thinking about listening to it that's great i hope you like it and um i appreciate you you um visiting Letting me visit, I should say. <laughs> Welcoming me into your home. Oh, thank you. Um, we really appreciate you giving the time. And thanks again to the Virtual Village Hall, of course. They are great. So if you enjoyed this, 
please come back <laughs> for our other talks and they do things daily so check them out um but yeah thank you again owen all right okay take care everybody take care bye